I mean, it it's gotten really ridiculous and it it is like I can't imagine that social media did not social media had a huge role in that. Mm, I yeah. mean, it's the comment section. Social media is just the comment section of anything. And the comment section devolves very easily into just nastiness. guys for watching this episode of my show reality check i want to just really thank ash for coming on the show i'm really excited not only to have her on but this is the first time i've gotten to see her and talk to her since she got married so congratulations on the wedding i'm so sorry i wasn't able to come i was so disappointed that it didn't work out but i saw from pictures it looked really it looked like it was just a really fantastic time despite all the the covid lockdowns and everything it was wonderful. The the some of the COVID restrictions ended up helping. So we mm-hmm. lost a ton of people that couldn't mm-hmm. come, right? Yeah. We were down to maybe 20 wow. people uh-huh. that ended up coming, but it actually helped because I've been to weddings and it's like you see and talk to the couple for like 10 seconds as they mm-hmm. say thank you and you don't see them again. Yeah. And this was like, we got to actually talk to every single person, every table that came there for like a good chunk of time, like have real conversations with everybody and spend a lot of time with, you know, the people that did come out. So it was a lot of fun. And the venue was so great because, mm-hmm. you know, they've lost so much business. So, uh, you know, they were and they also just knew what they were doing. Like they were a wedding venue, like Mm -hmm. this is what they do. So I didn't have to have an outside planner. They did all of that. They were like running the show with like headsets and stuff on day of. And it was just like, boom, here, you've got this much time. Boom. Next thing, next thing, next thing. And it was like, it was really well done. It was really Mm -hmm. not stressful at all. The worst thing, because I had always like, heard, read, seen about all of the problems that happen at weddings, that the flowers are messed up, that this is messed up, whatever. Mm. I was pretty much a laid back bride, like, as I also (laughs) had to keep dealing with everybody and their their COVID stuff. So Mm -hmm. my maid of honor wouldn't come inside for the reception and wore a mask. My next bridesmaid, same thing. Mm -hmm. But I was able to, okay, so they don't come inside, but we set up a table outside for them and they wore masks. So I've got them in masks and like all my pictures, but it was like, Mm -hmm. so I had to deal with that stuff. And so like, I couldn't even be a bridezilla, but it ended up just being really helpful. But day of wedding really weren't, wasn't any issue. The worst thing that actually happened was I was trying to get an earring out of my ear and I couldn't get it. So I asked my mom to help me. And it was hurting. It was like, you know, when you rip an earring out and it like, it, it's not coming out. Mm -hmm. And turns out finally that I have three earrings in each of my ears and Uh she was trying to pull out the wrong one. And it was one that had recently had like a little infection. So it was like super, super painful. Oh my gosh. That was, but that was the only bad thing that happened the entire wedding. Like Mm -hmm. that was it. And it's like, okay, considering like the horror stories that I hear about like, you know, vendors just not showing up or messing things up. It was like, this was not bad. (laughs) This was completely like, completely fine. Yeah, that's, that's really awesome to hear. And it was kind of, there was one wedding I was able to go to last year that was a little bit more local. And they also had a lot of people say, we can't come, but because they were pretty local, they still had a reasonable crowd. But I did feel like it feels a lot more selective, like the people that actually care are the ones that are here. And so, or like the people that, that are able to get here because they're closer are are here. And so sometimes it means that they, they have, you know, a little bit of a closer relationship. So I can totally see how that, you know, might happen with your wedding. And I'm really glad that that was the case because I've been, as you say, I've been to a lot of weddings where, oh, I got to see the bride once 
you know, I don't even have a picture with this bride, <laughs> like, and and we were really good friends, or or like I I got to shake the groom's hand one time, and then he's gone, right. like, yeah. yeah. So that we that's had, super awesome. Yeah, we had ended up having four tables. So mm -hmm. there was a table with our families, um, plus one. You know, uh, each of us had a. Um, what's the word, you know, honorary member of a family. So one was a neighbor that I grew up with. One was, for Nick, it was the mom of his best friend who was his best man. We mm -hmm. had a table of um, a bunch of uh, my attorney friends and then the table of like my local DC friends, right? Mm -hmm. And most of them you probably know on Twitter. Yeah. And then the table of the groomsmen, Nick had two groomsmen and my one bridesmaid that would come inside. So it was uh -huh. a tiny table of three. And then we had our, our wedding table. So it was like, you know, I had the people grouped with like who knew each other or would be right to get to know each other. Right. And that was it. So Julie Maidenberg actually flew out. Right. So I had mm -hmm. her at my DC friends table and she's like the same age and, you know, that same kind of personality and everything mm -hmm. and I told them ahead of time I'm like okay Julie's here she knows literally nobody at this wedding except me please adopt her and so <laughs> they all did and it was a lot of fun so that's awesome yeah it was it was great yeah so um I just for the audience's sake I don't know how many people are f familiar with you from from my audience I've got you know, several new people that are now watching my channel and people that watch my channel because I'm doing like reviews of WandaVision and stuff like that. So just to give a little backstory, we, we can talk about WandaVision for sure. But I, um, I need to, I know. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Uh -huh. I, I will be good. No spoilers. I, it, it's, it's such, it's so unfair for people to give spoilers for a show like this because it completely ruins it. So I will keep my mouth shut. I will be very good, even though I, you know, spoilers, spoilers, spoilers. But I do want to give uh, the audience just a little bit of a backstory for you, um, what you do and how you kind of came to be involved in politics and kind of in the, I don't know how, what you call it, because like there, there's like that group of like Twitter conservatives that are like semi-famous, but not really. They're Twitter famous for whatever that's worth. Um, and you're kind of in that group of Only Twitter. Only outside famous. lower end, <laughs> I think. <laughs> Um, yeah, I, I got into politics in 2008. I got an internship on a New Jersey congressional campaign that lost this 2008, but I ended up just falling in love with campaigning. Mm -hmm. And so right out of college, I went right back to New Jersey and started doing local elections. So the first one that I helped out with was school board. Um, which people really need to pay more attention to, especially these days. Pay attention to who's running for school board. Do it yourself. Yeah. Figure out what their their policies are. You know, like nobody votes in school board elections. And based on what we learn, people are teaching kids. You really, really should be making these races like about as important as like presidential at this point. You know. Yeah. But uh, so I helped out with that. But I would like, I seriously got back to from college, like two, three days before this election. So I was just like making phone calls, mm -hmm. walk, you know, stuff like that. But uh, then I was hired on with the county Republican headquarters um, where I lived in New Jersey and worked on the local races there. So state assembly, which is like the state house of representatives, state senate and a freeholder which is like a county wide position that new jersey has i don't quite know what <laughs> i still don't know what they really do <laughs> but um with those local elections and uh i was just you know low level first job out of college field representative i walked with the candidates door to door i ran a really successful door to door program um but uh i, I wasn't kept on after that and so I took a random writing job at Yellow Books doing SEO based websites that I hated, mm -hmm. but uh, I kept looking for political jobs. I wanted to go back to campaigning or anything that involved writing since I was a creative writing major. I eventually somehow got a, ended up getting a job at Heritage Action, moved to DC, then went to Heritage Proper, then was, uh, poached by the Washington Examiner 
And then I left the Washington Examiner and uh, worked for Watchdog.org and then uh, Real Clear Investigations and then finally made it to the Daily Wire. Mm -hmm. It was around 2014 when I started really getting into the kind of anti-feminism and uh, Title IX anti-sex discrimination, um, Mm -hmm. false allegations of sexual assault on college campus. And so it's pretty much been going on seven years now that I've been heavily focused in that kind of stuff, cancel culture, kangaroo courts, um, things of that nature. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that kind of culture is really coming in full swing, especially in 2020. It's crazy how many people who are conservative that I know that are just like, I don't want people to know where I work, or I don't want people to know X, Y, and Z about me because I, uh, you know, I don't want to have backlash against me. I don't want people showing up at my doorstep screaming at me because I told a joke on Twitter, you know, that kind of thing. And we, we've seen just over the years, just more and more and more of that kind of behavior where to the point where now even, you know, I don't want to say the words because YouTube is going to censor me, but just even that, the fact that I don't even want to talk about how the guy that held the largest and most uh, uh, famous and powerful position on the face of the earth now has had his Twitter taken away because he had the wrong opinions. It's just kind of, to me, indicative of, you know, we're all, we're now self-censoring us. I'm self-censoring myself because I'm like, I don't want my YouTube channel to be taken down. Just even right. little things like that. So right. how, how do you think, how do you think we got to this point so quickly? It's just like we, we took it up like three or four notches just in, in 2021 or 2020 and 2021 alone. Right. So uh, the crazy always starts on college campuses and mm-hmm. then it, then it leaves there. Um, I mean, if we go back over the years, like there's these major examples of, you know, people being canceled for stupid things they said on social media, you can usually name them by like Justine Sacco, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, The woman who made a really stupid AIDS joke and was fired by the time her plane landed in Africa because someone from Gawker saw that tweet and she had like a hundred followers And Mm -hmm. then they blew it up. She was a literal nobody. They blew it up and she gets fired and she's like a household name now. You have instances of that over the years. I mean, one of the first ones I remember was uh, Brendan Ike, who was the former CEO of Mozilla, who Mm -hmm. uh, they found out that he donated to Proposition 8 way back in the day. This is like almost a decade ago now in California, yeah. which passed, but a pair, like it was bad. Like the California people wanted it to pass, but mm-hmm. you know, the elites, the left, the, which is media controls, like or is con- controls the media, like decided this is bad. And he had to go because he donated to this. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, so that was one of the first ones that I remember. And, but a, most of it was contained to college campuses. Like your everyday stories were professors who were being treated this way for things that they had said, uh, because college students are so indoctr- indoctrinated with, um, I'm not like illiberalism, right? Cause mm-hmm. it's not progressivism. It's not liberalism. It's illiberalism. This idea yeah. of like, you know, constantly being offended, you are constantly a victim, everything is trauma. Uh, And so anyone who you disagree with is causing actual violence and harm to you through their opinions. So there shouldn't be allowed to say those opinions because speech is violence, right? Yeah. And so it's happened on college campuses, but that's always instructive. The larger uh, the larger population ends up dealing with this stuff because it escapes. So you also had, so the kangaroo courts that I were, I was always covering. And then in 2018, you have the Me Too movement, which was Mm -hmm. a, the broad social movement to do to people what campus kangaroo courts had already done, where an allegation is all that's needed to ruin someone's life, take everything away. It doesn't matter what the exculpatory evidence is, 
that doesn't get heard or that gets ignored or it gets completely explained away through some ridiculous mental gymnastics. Like if a woman is shown to be lying, it just means she's so traumatized by the event Mm -hmm. that she's now lying about it. So like literally there is no way to defend yourself. And the Me Too movement brought that to the broader population. Mm -hmm. And so all this cancel culture stuff this fear that everybody's living in, it just stems from that. I mean, at this point, we're basically very, very close to having the social credit system that China has. And we yeah. basically already have it. It's just not named and is not an official thing. You know, mm-hmm. like it, it works in the back back channels where, you know, you had all of these liberals, you know, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, a congresswoman, after the election saying that we need to create lists and anyone who worked for the Trump administration should never be allowed to basically exist ever mm. again. Like, yeah. And they say you can't work in government, you can't work here or whatever, but like they don't want these people working anywhere. These don't want these people to exist. Mm. And like the logical conclusion from all the things they say is that they basically want these people killed. And you just had the, what, MSNBC host Nicole Wallace talking about droning American citizens mm-hmm. who I think like still believe or something. It's like these people seriously want those who they disagree with dead because they have convinced themselves and the left has convinced them that people who disagree are Hitler. Mm-hmm like want death for others, which then becomes ironic because they want death for them. Mm-hmm. But no, yeah, that's totally fine. I feel like I just, I as an individual and being othered and made to feel like I am less than a human being because I have certain beliefs. And it's not even just in the media or in the broader culture. It's just even at a local level, you know, you have people who I was, maybe not necessarily friends with, but acquaintances with or former people that I worked with way back in like my real estate days and stuff. And, and they're, they're like coming after me now because I happened to vote for Trump in both 2016 and 2020. And I, especially in 2020 was much more uh, vocal about supporting Trump because he had a record. And I was like, you know, I don't necessarily like everything he says on Twitter, but He's done a lot of great things policy wise, much more so than I ever expected. I don't agree with like even everything policy wise, but still it was like, I want this guy in office. I don't want the other guy in office. Right. And I'm not because like Biden specifically yeah. said he was going to undo the good policies. Exactly. Of Trump. He said he was going to undo all of them. Right. The policies yeah. we may not necessarily agree with, but he specifically said he was going to undo the policies that helped the country that people liked, you know, like yes. he was just going to undo all of it. So yeah, I don't want to vote for that. But yeah, yeah ever and, since I've been in politics, there has been that kind of, you don't want to go out and say you're a conservative because the left mm-hmm. has convinced themselves that you're a Nazi yeah, and that you don't want them to exist. So, I mean, I just kind of had this weird kind of experience with this because I was refinancing my home mm-hmm. and I've, you know, not consider a friend, but I've been friendly with the loan officer that helped me buy this place. Like we'd Mm -hmm. joke around about stuff and whatever. And he was helping me on this again. And then at some, I said something about, uh, or he said something about that was kind of political or whatever. And then I don't remember what was said. It was like super mild. It wasn't even like some Mm -hmm. major thing. I think it was like something about we want to get out of DC or something. Mm -hmm. And he was like, he, or I think I had said something that like, you know, uh, because the administration didn't continue, my husband wasn't going to go into the administration. So we're going to move anywhere Mm -hmm. we want. And then he had said something. He's like, Oh, do you swing that almost like the, do you swing that way? Kind of yeah. like, I don't think those were his words, but it was like, oh, do you subscribe to that person? You know, like in that kind yeah, of yeah. tone. And it uh-huh. was like, yeah. And then like suddenly he wasn't mean to me. It wasn't different. It was just like we went from laughing and joking to kind of, okay, here's what needs to be done. <laughs> and yeah. Then, then it was like, I didn't 
interact with him as much as I had been until mm-hmm. like finally like I had called because there was this thing and we started joking again. And it was just like, okay. It was like there was this momentary like pause. Yeah. In a joking relationship because of this. And it was kind of like, why? Why do that? Like yeah. I have always been of the mindset of finding why I like people outside of politics, Mm -hmm. other interests, things in common. So a lot of my high school friends and college friends, I would see on Facebook just trashing conservatives and Republicans and like they should die and like all of these things. And I'm going to purge my list of these people. And I never got purged. So it was Mm -hmm. kind of like, hmm. but I stopped posting political stuff on Facebook, but I used to. Yeah. But some of these people, you know, one in particular, one of my re- best friends in high school still reaches out to me sometimes and will like my stuff. And you know why? And he will post things that are from the like, you know, the Infowars equivalent on the left. That's like, mm. I don't even, what are they called? The Young some Turks. Of them, some of things like that. Right. Yeah. And yeah. he'll still reach out and still like my stuff. And I got to imagine that for him, it's the same way as me as like, we were friends in high school because we were dorky theater kids. Mm. We're stored still dorky theater kids at heart. So yeah, we disagree on politics. So we're not going to get into a political conversation about it. He's going to like, you know, my pictures and I'm going to like his pictures and we're going to, you know, we had a conversation about my wedding, you know, this, he was giving me ideas for sparkly things. Mm -hmm. It was great. Okay. Because that was our relationship. It was never politics. And I think people from our past, and sometimes we forget, why did you like this person in the meantime? Did it have anything to do with politics? Probably not. One of my Mm -hmm. best friends now is a complete Trump hating liberal, but we still interact all the time because we still have dorky things in common. We still like video games and comic books. You know, like there are other reasons. And I know that like there's a lot of political people that are like, no, I can't um, I can't interact with someone when they don't think I should exist. And it's Mm -hmm. like that's never true. Right. But they're like, we'll say I I, like I exist or they hate me Mm -hmm. or they hate this group of people. And I shouldn't have to be friends with someone who thinks that way. But Mm -hmm. it's like they don't actually think that way. You know, like the the people that, you know, I disagree with politically, I don't think that they want another group of people dead or, or anything like that. And I know that my side doesn't want those things. Mm-hmm. But so many people on the left believe that about the right and believe that, OK, I'm not for open borders. Therefore, I hate Mexican people. Mm-hmm. Right. Like yeah. I hate anyone, like any immigrant immigrant. And it's not true. Yeah. Like, I want them to come here. I want them to come here legally. Yeah. I want them to find the American dream. I just want them to come here legally. If we can make that easier for them, for anyone that wants to come here and safer, okay, fine. Yeah. I don't like illegal immigration. But because of every, like, the way the conversation's gone now, it's like if you're not completely it's, for it's totally rolling out the red carpet, yeah. yeah, then you want these people dead, you're racist, you hate people, mm-hmm. all of this stuff. Yeah. And you see that on college campuses too, when they don't want conservative speakers to come, like a Ben Shapiro type, mm-hmm. right? Or, you know, Matt Walsh, who comes out and, you know, says the thing that Matt Walsh does. But it's like, even if they base these things in facts, in reality, mm-hmm. it doesn't, it doesn't like make people feel good about themselves and therefore it's hate and violence and they're going to get so much hate and violence on college campuses, even though those things, it doesn't happen. It doesn't yeah. happen. Like, yeah, I mean, there's, there's always been this perspective that people have thrown my way where it, like, So, like, I have traditional Christian beliefs, and traditional Christian beliefs state that the gay lifestyle is a sin, and we shouldn't participate in it, right? 
that doesn't mean I don't have gay friends. Like I'm, I'm really good friends with Spencer Clavin, for example. I have another good friend who works for Daily Wire who's also gay. He, he thought I was the greatest person on the planet, and and hey. we, we both knew we disagree on this issue, and we're neither of us is going to change each other's mind on it. And fine, move on. Like it's like end of discussion. We, you know, we don't have to agree on this. I don't want him to die because right or, or that, to be like to you be said. othered. Or, yeah. And he he also has the same perspective on me. He's like, okay, she has a different opinion. I don't want her to now be othered or discarded or treated as subhuman because she has a dis you know a disagreeing opinion with me on this thing. And, and but unfortunately, what happens is so many people think, okay, because she disagrees with with being gay or she thinks that that's not a good you know way to live your life. That means she wants gay people to die. And that's literally the opposite. It. Yeah. Exactly. That's and, not and true then, at all. Then, then they turn around and they say, well, now because she believes that we need to think that she needs to be, you know, eradicated from the earth. And so now you've got these two sides that believe that the other wants each other to just be wiped off the earth when the reality is, and in, in my case, in the example, the anecdotal example that I gave myself and my friend, uh, we couldn't care less. <laughs> like, right. It's like, I, I, you know, oh, he disagrees with me on this. And he's like, oh, she disagrees with me on this. And, and we're like, okay, fine. We'll just talk about something else that we do agree on. Or we'll talk about video games or music or whatever we actually connected on in the first place before this even came up. You know, most of the time you meet people and you don't even know these things about people. And you're just like, oh, okay, we disagree. Move on next day. <laughs> like, Right, exactly. It's, and like, all of this talk about unity was all, you know, I don't use a term I heard yesterday, which I know of. I've just, it's just on my mind. Hogwash. Yes. <laughs> uh, because there was never any going to be unity. It was believe what Biden and left believes or else yeah. you're Hitler, right? And you yeah. need to be eradicated from society and, and everything. That's what, when in that's reality, what true unity is. That's what true unity is, because unity means you agree with me and anything that doesn't align with that just doesn't exist, is othered, right. is gone, it should be eradicated. When they said unity, they meant unified thinking, not yes. what everybody else assumed unity. But like when most people think unity, they think about the what we were just talking about, your right. example, where it's like we can disagree on politics and still be friends. Right. Like, yeah. We don't have to accuse the other of wanting people dead. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And I feel like that's just such a foreign thing these days. Like there's again, there's people from my past who have come forth, found me on social media and they're like, oh, my gosh, she supported Trump. You you must be a monster. You must be, you know, literally Hitler, as they say. And I'm just like, well, wait a minute. We used to have political conversations. Like, what was it, five, ten years ago that I worked with you? We used to have nice conversations. We we used to talk about Trump. We used to talk about all these things and have reasonable conversations. Now you find me on social media years later when, you know, the temperature has been turned up 100 degrees higher. And you're like, oh, now it's acceptable to, you know, poke at her or or call her names or whatever. And I just think it's it's come down to the point where it's like people that I know in real life feel like they now have license to reach out to me on social media and either trash me or call me names or and, I, and I'm just like I never really cared like I've been on social media for long enough I've been on Twitter since 2010 I've been getting hate mail since Ben Shapiro started retweeting me in like 2013 and it's like I didn't care like oh you know, strangers on the internet are saying things about me. Who cares? Now it's like people in real life who are now feel like they have license to treat people like crap just because it's the internet. And I wouldn't be surprised, you know, as it gets closer and closer to home, if people are starting to come up to other people on the street with masks, obviously, but like if people are now feeling like license, I mean, we've even seen it with, with Antifa and with all of the Black Lives Matter riots Everybody feels like license. Now we can act as badly as we do on Twitter in real life. And more right. and more people seem to be subscribing to that. Right. If they see an old man wearing a MAGA hat, it's totally fine to beat him to within right. an inch of his life because he wore a MAGA hat. And so that clearly means he's racist monster. I mean, it it's gotten really ridiculous. And it, it is like I can't 
imagine that social media did not, social media had a huge role in that. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's the comment section. Social media is just the comment section of anything. And the comment section devolves very easily into just nastiness. And so Twitter is basically just one big comment section. Yeah. It doesn't matter context. You just assume the worst about people and then you act on that. And uh, sometimes like you dig at someone I'm okay with, you know, yeah, like, yeah. oh, being sarcastic, pointing out hypocrisy, whatever. but so much of it is like, you know, the stuff Jim Carrey does, mm-hmm. right? With the drawing pictures and like, you know, the celebrities that are like, these people need to be killed, you know, like, it's like, yeah, like you think like, and then there's no consequences for that. Mm -hmm. Right. And I'm not saying, oh, we should never make a movie with Jim Carrey, but that like someone needs to talk to him and like Mm -hmm. talk to him about love and unity. Right. But, you know, Joe Schmo college professor who said, you know, had a tweet like three years ago that people now find racist is like, he's gone. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's the other thing too, is you've got so many instances of sometimes there's things that are said online that were okay 10 years ago, 20 years ago, whatever, or that were considered funny to say. I remember when using what is now known as the R word was completely okay when I was in high school, because it was meant as the equivalent of saying someone was stupid. It wasn't to say that they were disabled necessarily. It was to say, oh, that was a dumb thing you did. Oh, that was a dumb thing I did. The same way that anybody would use the word stupid. But now all of a sudden saying someone is retarded is is considered ableist and all this stuff. And I'm just like, I didn't use the word when I was in high school, but I also don't think somebody should be canceled over it. Like, and I don't think people should be canceled over anything other than something that's actually criminal. Right. Or something Same that's here because yeah, everything else that. is like you can have a backlash, you mm-hmm. can be shamed for saying something stupid, but the forgiveness and the the you know growth is not allowed. Mm-hmm. You're not allowed yeah. to be forgiven, you're not allowed to learn. The learning is that you're done. Yeah you're out of life. Okay. Hopefully you can get, you know, a job where no one ever sees you or hears from you ever again. Mm -hmm. It's like, I just, I don't like that. I, I don't like people should be allowed to learn and apologize and grow and be forgiven. Yeah. I mean, a lot of the things that people get canceled for really are like, we'll just, we can just tell that person that this is a really bad thing to have said. Yeah. And And now they know that and that will never happen again. And they have learned and they have grown. It's never going to happen again. You know, like, especially the things that like people have said 10 years ago as teenagers, as stupid teenagers, Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Was like, oh, do they say that now? Doesn't matter. They said it once and it happened to be online. That's it. That's exactly who you are for the rest of your life. Apparently. Mm -hmm. I mean, and it's not true because everybody grows up. Everybody learns. And then people from different generations, like, I mean, things were fine during their generation and they're not now. And it's like some people are still learning that Mm -hmm. and it takes like it's not like like you said earlier the left wants it an instant overnight and anyone who doesn't comply at the moment they decide this has to be the way it is then they're done Mm -hmm. and it's like a lot of people are out living their lives not paying attention to this stuff not on twitter what is it only seven percent of the country is on twitter or something and yeah, and most like, of them it, aren't like on political Twitter. Yeah. They're in like their own community Twitter of like following people that are relevant to their interests and their mm-hmm. friends and things like that. Not paying attention to the fact that Merriam Webster's dictionary has defined as redefined a word again. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Hey guys, this is Warrior Woman 91, and you're listening to Reality Check. 
I hope you guys are enjoying today's episode, and I just wanted to let you know that if you want to support the podcast, you can go over to patreon.com and sign up for any one of two of my tiers that I have available. If you guys want to just be a basic supporter, you can have your name read at the end of the show, or if you want to be a super supporter, you can not only have your name read at the end of the show, but you can also find out which guests are coming up next and submit questions. Unlike my previous podcast, only Patreon subscribers will be allowed to submit questions and potentially have them read. So check me out over on Patreon. It's so frustrating how Twitter went from such a wonderful tool for free speech, for social media. Like it was being used in, I remember back in 2009 when, the Arab Spring was happening and there was this big like Twitter uprising of people in Iran who were actually speaking out against the government for the first time and using Twitter. And then now all of that is gone. Nobody's allowed to use Twitter for that kind of thing anymore. It's like it's almost like China bought Twitter, essentially. And I wouldn't be surprised if, <laughs> if we find out about more stuff like that uh, in the future. But it's it's like it's the most opposite. It it did a complete 180 in literally 10 years. It went from free speech hub where people were really, you know, like a little stupid college student Kelly was able to come on Twitter and talk about politics and interact with a Ben Shapiro or uh, whoever, like David Limbaugh or whoever I was interacting with at the time. And, you know, it it jump-started my career for sure. And it went from that to you literally cannot say anything or we'll take your Twitter away. Like yeah. you post the wrong combination of words, even if you're joking and we will take your Twitter away because the right. almighty algorithm says we will take it away. And so- I've noticed for Twitter specifically in like the past, maybe three years that I finally realized it with my own behavior on Twitter. Mm-hmm. And that when you start to look at other people's, individual tweet stats you start to realize that this seems to be what a lot of people have started doing on Twitter where I retweet a whole lot less than I like Mm -hmm. and I mean there have been some articles where you know the people gawkers not there anymore but people like at the Daily Beast or um, Salon or, or Slate or something will like go into somebody's likes and be like, they Mm -hmm. like this tweet and that's bad. But for the most part, that hasn't become the norm. Mm -hmm. And so I've seen just people with thousands of likes and like 12 retweets. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's hundreds of likes and like 12 retweets. It's, you you know, hundreds of retweets, but like thousands of likes. And there's always been more likes than retweets, but the gap now has gotten so much bigger. And I'm pretty sure that it's just people not wanting to retweet things that might be used against them in the future. Or, Mm -hmm. you know, like I have a rule where it's like, sometimes I'll read someone's tweet and I'm like, yeah, yeah, I agree with it. And then they end it by like calling the person, you know, like swearing at them or something. And it's like, you had me, you had me until then. I would have retweeted you, but like, I don't like that. So now it's just a like, you know? Yeah. But like, that'll be used against me. It's like, oh, do you, you know, like fear that that'll be used against me when it's like, I agreed with the first part, not the second part. That's why I didn't retweet it. I just liked it, you know, but it's like, that probably won't last. Like eventually it, the more media outlets, like the New York times will probably do it pretty soon just start going through what, you know, Ted Cruz liked in order to find, you know, something to use against him. And then it'll be a free call. I've actually done that myself because I did some like oppo research for this past election on a local candidate. Mm -hmm. And he, you know, scrubbed his Twitter site of everything, of retweets, of you know, just generally tweets having to do with any election. That's really what people need to do. I just, yeah, sometimes I feel like I had some good tweets. Yeah. I can't ever find them. I should just scrub them. Yeah. So what happened was he was portraying himself as a candidate that he wasn't. So he was trying to say, I'm bipartisan. I'm not, I'm not getting involved in, in elections and I don't have anything to do. I'm not going to choose sides. I'm not going to go Biden or Trump. And I'm like, yeah, that means you're probably on the left. So I was like, I need to prove this so that I can tell other people not to vote for this guy. Mm-hmm. So, but he, like I said, he scrubbed his social media, except his likes. 
So I went back and I found all of his likes of Bernie Sanders posts, of Kamala Harris birthday posts, of um, you know, BLM posts and all this kind of stuff. And I was able to say, well, you know, he deleted all his other tweets, but not these. And this kind of indicates that he's definitely not the candidate that he's portraying himself and as. See, I actually don't have a problem with that. What I have yeah. a problem with is when people go into a like and it's like, oh, they liked this person who said something about illegal immigration, mm -hmm. let's cancel them. You yeah. know, if someone is liking things that is clearly different than what they say, if someone is liking things like, you know, people act, like asking others to commit crimes, mm -hmm. if they're liking, you know, what was the, you know, a pro Hitler account. Yeah. Okay, maybe, but with, that, that's not even the articles that have been written. It's like, right. oh, well, yeah. he liked this tweet from this person and guess what else this person tweets? And it's like the person that liked their one tweet probably doesn't know what their other, you know, like Trump used mm -hmm. to get that yeah. all the time. He retweeted this person. Well, this person tweets about this. And it's like, you think Trump like went through all of their tweets yeah. to determine maybe I should like nobody does that. And the media started like doing that to people. Mm -hmm. And so they'll do that with likes. Um, Sometimes and... though, when somebody likes something, it's not because they actually liked the post personally, it's because they're saving the post so that they can, you know, talk about it later or whatever. Yeah, I do it that sets too, I make a mental note. And yeah. it's like, that's right, mm -hmm. interesting. Yeah. Maybe but... I'm gonna write about it, so I don't wanna retweet it and then like ruin, you know, my traffic. I, it's right. like, there's so many reasons for liking tweets. And I used to, you know, the uh, retweets don't equal endorsements became mm -hmm. a big thing because sometimes you retweet, like sometimes I'd retweet things that are outside my political views because I think it's an interesting take, mm -hmm. even if I don't agree with it. I think, you know, maybe my followers should see it. Maybe they would like it, you know? but you're not allowed to do these things. Like they will use it against you and they will assume your intent. Mm -hmm. And but you're no not allowed to like explain to intent behind that. It's yeah. what we decide your intent is, that's your intent. I feel like nuance is just completely dead nowadays. <laughs> it's like, you can't, you can't be sharing it because you know, you thought it was interesting, but you didn't necessarily agree with it. It's like you have to put like a ton of fine print un under everything you post on social media right. now. And Unless e you're like a prominent Democrat, then yeah. then it's completely completely okay. Then it's fine. But there's two there's two subjects I wanted to quick touch on before we wrap wrap up the the whole show. But the first topic was. Um, this this episode may not air uh, for a while after uh, after we record, but what happened in this past week is AOC came out and was crying on social media, talking about you know what the incident at the Capitol and talking about uh, potentially the fact that she allegedly was sexually assaulted prior to this and it kind of exacerbated um, you know her PTSD from that. And so my my thought about this is I. I have extreme sympathy for women who have actually experienced sexual harassment and sexual assault and all of that kind of thing, especially because I feel like for a long time, I, I didn't believe that sexual harassment was as prominent as it is. But the problem is there's so many women who weaponize it and who use it at, whether it happened or not, they know that it's, it's like, it's the un it's it's the wall that no one can get past. If you put up that that shield of I was sexually harassed or I was sexually assaulted, no one can get through that, whether it's true or not. And so they right. always you're not allowed to criticize them ever. Exactly. You know, pretty much yeah. ever again. So I guess my question for you on this is, what was your take on on her coming out and and talking about that, and and how do you think we need to react when politicians bring that up? Because like I said, I, I just, it makes me ill that so many women, whether they're in politics or not, will use it as a weapon rather than using it as, okay, 
this is a bad thing that needs to stop. I'm raising awareness so that people know that, you know, you should come forward and you should talk about it. You should at least tell somebody close to you so that they can prevent it from happening again and all that kind of thing. But it goes so far beyond that. So how do you think we should deal with that just like going forward and just using that as the the incident that's the, like the most recent in the news? I mean, honestly, people should be allowed to doubt again. Yes. <laughs> I mean, she's never mentioned this before, ever. I mean, uh, you know, throughout the campaign, throughout the Me Too movement, she's literally never, never said this. Never said, I've, I've been there with you. I've, I've experienced never, never until now. And I mean, it's very cynical. It's, you know, as you said, it's, it's, it's very scripted. It's very deliberate, you know, um, it's, it's all of a sudden, because look at when she made the, made that claim and all of her like other claims is when people were calling on her to apologize to Ted Cruz for saying that he tried to have her murdered. Right. Mm -hmm. And so then all of a sudden, no one was talking about how she claimed other senator that uh, senators were trying to have her murdered. Suddenly it's, oh, poor AOC. Right. Oh, no. And then, you know, Congresswoman Mace comes out and says, you know, I was in that same hallway and this is not what happened. They're like, how mm -hmm. dare you? How dare you? You know, she, it was the Capitol complex. It is traumatizing. And it's like, you know, it could we just, we have this society and whether this is where AOC fits into it or not, we just have this society where people want to be victims. And so, you know, they will intensify just anything that happens to them mm -hmm. if they're slightly like close to it. Right. Yes. Oh, you know, like suddenly you were basically the one targeted. And like, I can understand how she would have been afraid thinking, well, I'm pretty much the most hated congressperson on the right, you know, by the right, maybe they would come for me. I could mm -hmm. understand that. Um, and even if Capitol Police were banging on the walls, I'm not sure they would have done that considering what was going on. Yeah. Uh, but it may have seemed like that. And if you're sitting there listening to TV of like, and like, oh, they're doing this in the Capitol and then any banging on the wall would probably mm -hmm. sound like that. But like you said, it was all, it was weaponized mm -hmm. to then take the heat off of her for, you know, I don't know if it was libelous or mm -hmm. what, but like yeah. her ridiculous claims that Ted Cruz tried to have her killed. Yeah. I mean, it, that's what politicians do is they, if something is, going wrong with them if the heat is on them mm -hmm. they turn it around that's what politicians do yeah. i mean sometimes it doesn't work like when uh harvey weinstein tried to say i'm gonna focus on gun control right uh -huh. didn't work. yeah okay <laughs> but a lot of times it works yeah and it, this is one of those instances and she knows yeah right? all right she knows like the sexual assault thing to all of a sudden bring that up and like, how dare you? I'm traumatized. Yeah. By this thing that I've literally never mentioned ever before. Mm -hmm. It's so frustrating to me for that people would de devalue, you know, an incident that can be really traumatizing to a woman. And now they're taking it and they're using such a terrible thing and just being like, oh, I'm just going to take advantage of this and I'm just going to either make up that or this thing happened or point. yeah yeah and and it it really just it devalues the legitimate claims that women do have that now people are going to be suspicious of those women who have you know who maybe actually were sexually assaulted or even sexually harassed or whatever it happens to be now people are going to be like well because this person lied and because this person lied and because this person lied even though you, whether you have evidence or not, I'm still skeptical of you now because so many people use it to yeah. either lie or get attention. Well, that's, or that's been the misdirect. problem with false yeah. accusations and what I've been covering for years for you, like, because you 
have the media will just take an allegation and just blow it up. Oh my goodness. And it's Mm -hmm. like the truth. They don't dig into it. They don't do even rudimentary steps to verify it. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, there will be things that sometimes the allegations are just super vague. So there's nothing to verify. Mm -hmm. Makes it really easy. Right. But when they're specific, sometimes you can go check certain things, documents, records. Media won't do that. They'll just blow it up. So Mm -hmm. if you remember, like, And then uh, a lot of the biggest, most high profile accusations have ended up being false because the media just runs with the narrative that they want to run with. So you have Mm -hmm. Tawana Brawley, you have Duke LaCrosse, you have the Rolling Stone rape hoax, right? Mm -hmm. And these are the biggest stories. And then people see them. And anytime there is a high profile person making an accusation or high profile media outlets, just repeating accusations without any, you know, evidence or talking to the other side or anything like that, then people start to get skeptical, you know? Mm -hmm. It's like all those hate crime claims that always turn out to be hoaxes. Like Jussie Smollett and pretty Mm -hmm. much every news found on a college campus is a hoax, you know? And so people see that and it's like, same thing, the, the other one was the, the waitress receipts, right? Mm-hmm. This yeah. person didn't leave me a tip, but they, le- they left me a nasty note. Yeah. Always fake, you know? All of these things are fake, so nobody believes them. Mm-hmm. You can't believe them, especially when someone comes out with some, like, major allegation at a very, imo- like, opportune time without ever having mentioned it before. So yeah. you have... People like that are like, like what, making like, these right. allegations when it's like, oh, well, they're going through a divorce. Yeah. Hmm. Maybe like, they have a reason to do this. With Brett Kavanaugh, it was just so utterly convenient that all of a sudden in the 11th hour, now they found this this date rape or this, I can't remember, it, it was like, it was a rape allegation, but it was like, I, I can't remember what the, what the term they used um, for that specific instance, but it was like so utterly convenient and, and they're like, oh, he's, he's just like a mass rapist and he's this and he's that. And I'm just like, okay, so if this was legitimate and she, you know, she gets up and she's crying on stage and this and that. They and kept just, saying she was credible just because. Yeah. Just because she's crying on stage and, and or, or in front of the camera. And I'm just it like, was stage. Yeah. It yeah. Was yeah stage. It, it was pure theater. And that's what, that's what I'm saying. It's like, when you when you wait for the the most politically opportune moment to do this, it's just like, okay, that that immediately makes me think you're not credible. If this was a real thing for you, then you should have come forward before. And right. I'm not saying it isn't hard, and I'm not saying it isn't embarrassing, and I'm not saying you're not going to get scrutiny. But if you're serious about this person needs to pay for what they did, then you need to take initiative and deal with it as soon as possible, not wait until it's politically expedient or you think you're going to get the most attention or whatever, because that in, immediately makes me think, okay, maybe this didn't actually happen because you're doing it not because of the incident. You're doing it because this person might become successful or might, uh, you know, win an election or whatever it happens to be. Especially when you look into those allegations, you find out that, yeah, that pretty much was the case. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, Again, in the Kavanaugh case, it's it's still not even proven these people were ever in the same room yeah. under the same roof together. Like, there's literally no proof of that. Yeah. So, I mean, th- those allegations are just even beyond anything else because they didn't go to the same school. They had some friends in common, mm-hmm. lived in the nearby area. But, I mean, that that's it. There's... Yeah literally no evidence these people ever even met yeah I was I was remembering there was like there was some sort of a there was like a sexual allegation against uh Ted Cruz when he was running for uh president or um yeah all of his former aides apparently they had all the pictures of like all and like it wasn't even like the women those women that came forward it was like the media saying this had happened to all these women so then they were dragging those women through the mud who also said, no, this never happened. Why are you saying this happened? And they're like, well, we're saying it happened because, because he's running for president. We don't want him to win. But, right. 
um, it, it, it just was hilarious to me. So like, they always go for that because it's such an easy shield. It's an easy target. Even when it's the most absurd, like Ted Cruz doesn't even take his like jacket off before he goes to bed. Like the most clean cut guys that you will ever find. <laughs> they're, they're like, we're just going to, we're just going to throw the sexual uh, assault allegation out at them and, and, and hope it sticks. So yeah. it, it just, it just really frustrates me and infuriates me when, when something that I consider a very, very serious allegation is just, you know, and thro- serious thrown crime. Like, yeah. like this is the worst, the worst crime to do to someone outside of murder. Yeah. Like, and it's just, it's just thrown out there. It's just, you know, whenever in order to get sympathy and attention. It's true. Yes. 100%. And while the media tries to claim that um, punishing false accusers will keep real accusers from coming forward, it's the complete opposite. Like, yeah. completely allowing false accusations to just be easy, right? Like, basically welcoming them for media narratives and cudgels against men, you make people not believe women. Yes. Because you're elevating false accusations because then you're not going to believe the next woman. So if you were to, you know, try to not make it okay to falsely accuse someone, maybe people wouldn't falsely accuse so much. Yeah. It, 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 it's almost doing those men a favor. The men that are actually, you know, sexually assaulting, sexually harassing women, you're actually doing them a favor by creating now this bubble of, oh, now people don't want to believe the women that we're doing this to. So now we can just do it even more because, right. you know, people are going to think that these women are just making it up or lying. And, you know, we can just take advantage of that now. So, yeah. um, but I did want to move on to my last topic, which I think is a much more fun topic. And <laughs> I kind of, I asked this question to everybody at the end to try and get a little bit more fun and games type. And since you are a video gamer, I wanted to know what are the, like, video games you're playing right now or upcoming TV shows you're looking forward to or shows or movies that you're watching right now. If we're not watching very many movies, but any TV shows or anything like yeah, that. I do have a movie uh, in the background, you know, oh, okay. it's, it's there primer. We so you don't <laughs> need to pay not one that you don't really need to pay attention to. Yeah. That's a joke. Primer is one of the most difficult movies to understand. Anyway, um, <laughs> I'm still playing animal crossing <laughs> almost a year now. I've missed, I think two days of playing the game and uh, one of those days was because I was playing Stardew Valley and then the other one uh, was the day that my cat died but Aww. other than that I have completely like I play Animal Crossing every single day um, still I just, most of the time I'm just running my game errands but um, as far as other game that I'm car- currently playing I decided to dig out my copy of Fable 2, mm-hmm. which is from 2008 for Xbox 360. And I'm playing through that because it was always one of my favorite games. Um, but because there's not like a lot of games that have come out recently um, that I'm really excited about that I've been interested in. But there are games that are coming out at the end of February. uh, Bravely Default 2 comes Mm. out. It's a Square Enix RPG. Um, And I like the first game. Looking forward to the second game on Switch. Or other... It's definitely on Switch. It might be... I mostly play Switch now, so I don't Mm. really know. Yeah. But uh, I'm looking forward to that one. I also love pretty much any Stardew Valley, Harvest Moon farming game so there's a new harvest moon game coming out in early march and then there's a new story of seasons game coming out in late march and that's pretty much what i'm looking forward to games wise the next uh few months uh currently keep introducing my husband to some of my favorite sitcoms so we just watched silicon valley and Mm -hmm. uh we're sad watching the last episode because it's like you wanted to keep going, but it unfortunately became way too relevant Yeah, with how social media companies uh, operate. So now we're watching The League, which is another one of my favorites. Uh, and I'm also watching Doctor Who, and I'm kind of always watching Doctor Who. 
Well, I highly recommend that you check out WandaVision because I've been doing the whole series and my reviews after each episode. Yeah. <laughs> so, like, um, I want to. Uh, I I haven't been watching Marvel movies for, like, the past few years. I, mm. I think the last one I actually watched was uh, Infinity War. Mm-hmm. I mean, I don't know why. I always loved Marvel movies, but I've just... I mean, I think it's because I'm just not going to the theater overall. And then they come out on Netflix and I don't know why. I just watch. I keep watching movies that I haven't watched or that I've already Mm. watched rather than new movies. Yeah. If I watch a movie that I haven't watched before, it's because it was my husband's night to pick. (laughs) Yeah, it's like that's kind of how it's working where it's not like, oh, here's a movie that neither of us have seen. Let's watch it unless it's a horror film. Yeah. Well, I think, again, this TV series is going to lead into Marvel's first horror movie. And so that's why I'm like, everybody needs to watch this show because it's going to make that I'm interested in. Yeah. We just watched that X-Men kind of horror film, Mm -hmm. like the New Mutants or whatever. It was good there. It it tried. It could have been scarier. But I liked I, I, I liked the idea of a horror film is set in the Marvel universe. Yeah, that's what's coming down the pike with the new Doctor Strange movie. And that's what this TV series, WandaVision, kind of sets up for what's gonna happen in that movie. And it's it it gets it's like super lighthearted in the beginning. And we're now at episode five and it just got really, really dark really fast. So I think I think it would be something you'd be interested in. Um, and no, I'm not being paid by Disney. I just really <laughs> love the show. And people keep, like, even my coworkers were teasing me. If you were paid by Disney, like, you wouldn't be standing in front of, like, a white wall. Like It's true. You know, this would, this would be a much different production if you were paid <laughs> by Disney to say anything. This is true. Although they're, they're more recent interviews, they've all got, like, the same gray background and, like, the logo in the corner. And it's like, wow, your uh, production design has really taken a hit during COVID. But um, I really appreciate you coming on the show, Ash. It's always a pleasure to talk to you. I feel like we could talk for another hour. Hopefully, I know you're not that big of a fan of Minecraft, but I'm trying to get Neon Taster, our mutual friend, to play Minecraft with me. And we should just make it a threesome and get us all in the Minecraft server. Okay, and what version do you play? Do you play where you have to like fight or do you play in the like free build? I, yeah, I play survival. So uh, okay. like I get killed regularly. However, my goal with the survival mode and no, he's not going to watch this, so he won't know. But I, my plan is to have him build his own house and I'm going to come over in the middle of the night and set it on fire. <laughs> So that's why you need to join so that we can. But then you, know, you set my house on fire. No, we'll be a team. We can team okay, up and we'll have and, a pack. <laughs> yes, <laughs> we'll have a pack. He's never gonna watch this episode, or and if he does, you know, the fans can write to him and say, hey, you, this is what Warrior Woman ninety one has planned against you. You better be prepared for this game. <laughs> so. Um, um, so I'm just going to wrap up the episode. Thank you guys so much for watching the show. Comment below what you guys like best. And if you think that we should live stream this Minecraft idea of mine, because I think it would be so fun. We'll use, we'll use Neon Tasters Twitch because I have no followers on Twitch. But um, if you guys like this episode, please give it a like. Subscribe to the channel. Ring the bell to get notifications. Comment below. All that good stuff. Ash's uh, social media will be in the description below. And I will talk to you guys on the next video.